Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Sally. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. I want to thank Joe and Corliss and, and all of the committee for inviting me and for the fruit basket and these beautiful flowers. They're really going to make me feel like a lady. I, I thank you for your hospitality and your generosity and for the opportunity to share. I'm one of those damn Yankees that was referred to a minute ago, and I'm not going to say any more than that. There is a difference between Yankees and damn Yankees. The Yankees come south for a visit, and then they go home. And the damn Yankees, like Phil and Sally, we come south for a visit, and we stay, and we stay, and we stay. And we're still here. And it's a good place to be. And I was I was really happy that I was on the program for Wednesday night. I thought, you know, the first night there'd be maybe nine or eleven people here, and I felt comfortable with that, and I think I stepped to here, and I say, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm glad this room is air-conditioned. I have a terrible time with hot rooms, and, and I'm, I hope it's fixed before we move in that other place. I, I think about a talk I made shortly after we had moved to Wetumpka, Alabama, uh, right above Montgomery. I hadn't been sober too long. And uh, I, I hadn't gotten to the Wetumpka group. It was a very small country town. And I kept going back to the big city of Montgomery to my home group, which was in a very lush, plush church. And when they finally asked me to speak in Wetumpka, I guess I'd had 11 months of sobriety. It was on a warm night in March 1973. Okay. And I made what has to be the most fantastic AA talk I have ever heard in my life. It was truly inspired. Every thought, the vocabulary was there for it, and I verbalized and articulated, and it was just grand. I, I remember thinking, you know, Dr. Bob and Bill are, are tuned into me somehow, and they, they've got to be thinking, you know, how fortunate they are that I finally found the fellowship. And... <laughs> And I knew I was going to be the uh, Miss AA of Elmore County from that moment on. I think there were four people there sitting on the edge of their seats listening to me. I didn't find out until three or four months later that two of them at least were stone deaf. (laughs) But they sat there and they smiled and they nodded their heads and they poked each other. and, And it was just, it was absolutely fantastic. And then after I, I finished, you know, they were standing around and congratulating me and asking my advice on, on various things. And, and it got hotter and hotter and hotter. And John Billy's um, air conditioner at the, at the window was making a lot of racket, but that's all it was doing. And I started sweating. And I, I don't perspire like ladies are supposed to do. I sweat a lot. And, and I was standing there being so gracious, and I could feel this water running down my face. And, you know, after a while, it was in my eye, and it was in my mouth, and I, I finally went like this and happened to look at my hand, and it was full of black water. And I'd had a hair rinse put on my hair that morning. <laughs> black stains down my face for the next three days and it was one of of the first of many vivid lessons in humility that I know God sent my way and I needed that at that time you may see me sweating again this weekend I hope it's not for the same reason but I I will tell you this I no longer wear hair rinses I use something much more permanent now I am an alcoholic, and I don't know why, and and for a long, long time I beat my breast and shook my fist at God and said, why me, God? And I was so filled with anger and bitterness and 
self-pity that I couldn't do the things that I thought everybody else in the world could do. I, I don't know why. Nothing in my background or early childhood would ever indicate that this was ahead for me. I am the oldest of three children. I was born in Upper New York State. And when I was just two, my father joined the uh, Army Air Corps as a, a chaplain. He was a Methodist minister. And it was a good family, and it was a good home. We lived like gypsies, like military people do. We were very secure in the love that our parents had for each other and that they had for us, and, and it, it was a happy home. I grew up very quickly, and I think military children tend to do this, perhaps. So. I grew up very lonely, and having friends and, and a sense of belonging was the most important thing in the world to me. And just by the very nature of, of the lives we led, I never really had that sense of belonging, a sense of roots. And when I finally was able to make friends and, and warm up a little bit, you know, the orders were cut, and it was time to move on some other place. And I'm not saying that, that being a military dependent had anything to do with my being an alcoholic because a lot of kids grow up that way and they're not drunks. But it was very hard for me learning how to make friends. And, and after a while, I just said, I don't care if I don't, and that's the way I'll act, and that's the way I'll try to think. And there was a facade about me, and there was a big act. And, and none of this is new to, to alcoholics. Most alcoholics have these same feelings or some of them I found out uh, I skipped a grade when I was in the seventh grade and, and when I was 16 I graduated from high school in Montgomery Alabama my folks were transferred at that time to St. John's Newfoundland and I was left there and, and um, I was angry at that for a very long time I, I was very mature acting and independent, uh, and it was my decision to stay. I know that now, and I, I've, I've come to realize that since I've been in AA, I've remembered. They really wanted me to go with them and, and stay and work a year in Newfoundland and, and then go someplace else to college. My nearest relative was my grandmother in New York State, and she was a little bit hostile at the time. There was an Air Force base in, in Montgomery, and we decided that I would stay there and attend Huntington College, a small Methodist school. I met my husband at Huntington. He was, um, Jim is a big ex-Marine type. He's uh, never attempted anything, I don't believe, that, that he hasn't been a success at. And this included teaching himself how to, to walk again after a plane crash and 1955, and he was told he'd never walk, and he spent 11 months in the Pensacola Naval Hospital and started at Huntington. I didn't drink at Huntington or in college. It was against the rules, and I believed in obeying the rules, but I did get in trouble with drugs a little bit, and I've got to talk a little bit about that because my I'm absolutely convinced now the progression of alcoholism in me began with an addiction to other other drugs. But sometime in my sophomore or junior year, somebody was passing out little triangular-shaped pills, and he said, here, if you take these, you can stay awake and cram and uh, for your exams, and you don't have to, you don't get feeling sleepy, and you can go take the exam the next day, and, you know, everything is fine and beautiful. And I, I tried one, and I have just vivid recollections of my first experience with a mind-altering, mood-altering drug. I loved it. I was a complete setup for that medication at that time. Nobody was talking about speed, and nobody was talking about amphetamines in 57 and 58, but that's what it was. I loved it. You know, I wasn't, didn't have to feel insecure or shy. Uh, I didn't want to study. I wanted to talk, and I talked a lot. And I could, you know, I, I was this person all of a sudden. I was at least five foot nine and very slender, I thought, I felt, and very blonde. And just what I always wanted to be. 
And I would talk to anybody about anything all night long. And if that person went to sleep, I'd find somebody else to wake up, and I'd talk and talk and talk some more. I was vaguely aware sometime in there that a girl on the floor up above me had convulsions, and they said it was because of these drugs. And I remember thinking that would never happen to me. And it did. But not at that point. Jim and I were married the uh, the day I graduated. My folks came down from New Jersey where they were stationed. And Daddy married us out of the, out of the chapel at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery. <coughs> Excuse me. And we had one very, very good year of marriage that first year. I taught school in Montgomery, and he was with a telephone company. And at the end of that year, I was pregnant, and he was transferred to Birmingham. And in 1960, in Birmingham, our first son, Stephen, was born. Uh, that, that first year, there had been just a very little bit of drinking, no drugs, no, no medication for anything. The only medication I ever took pregnant with Stephen was, uh, I think, vitamins and, and maybe iron. Um, but with, with the birth of this first child, I was experiencing some legitimate problems, and the doctor said, here, I think this will help you, and he wrote a prescription for my first tranquilizer. And what a setup I was for that drug. And I have, again, vivid recollections of the first time I really felt the effect of a downer, of a sedative. And when that stuff entered my bloodstream, I thought this is the most wonderful thing in this world. And, and it, like the amphetamine, it did something for me that I couldn't do for myself. And I didn't feel tense. And I didn't feel anxious. And I didn't have to feel angry. And I didn't have to lie awake and not be able to sleep. And it did all those wonderful things. And I remember the first time I took one too many, and that was accidental. But I remember feeling a little bit drunk, and I laughed, and I told Jim, and I said, feel a little bit drunk. And I loved it. And I remember, too, his concern. He said, please be careful with that stuff. And I don't think I ever took that prescription again the way it was prescribed. I abused it from that time on. And I abused other medication that I was put on. In 1963, we were living in Tuscaloosa, and our second son, John, was born. And during that pregnancy, I had managed to become addicted to massive amounts of tranquilizers. i have been prescribed amphetamines again. Uh, I was taking pain pills and sleeping pills, and I was a zombie on drugs. Jim had been transferred to Montgomery, and I was to stay in Tuscaloosa and sell a house and take care of a premature baby and a -a two-and-a-half-year-old little boy. And I was just on a yo-yo with all these medications. And and, uh, at the end of the week, on Friday, I had a lady come in to help me with the house and the children. And when she got there, I said, look, you know, I'm tired. I've been up all week. And I've got to get some sleep, so I'm going to go to bed, and when it's time for you to wake up, you you let me know. When it's time for you to go home, you let me know, and I'll take you home. And the one thing that could get me off the pills faster than anything else was the bourbon. And that's the way I first learned about bourbon and, and what whiskey could do for me. And I'd go to the bourbon bottle, and I would pour a great big slug of that stuff and get it down and knock myself out and sleep real fast. When Jim got home, you know, I'd have lipstick on somehow, and he'd say, uh, how are you? And I'd say, I'm just fine. I had a next-door neighbor who, who saw something of what was going on, and she tried to help me, and she offered to come babysit and take care of the children. And she'd come say, how are you? And I'd say, I'm just fine. You know, I can do this myself. And I heard an AA talk one time. He he said, you know, there's one way to tell a drunk. He said, a drunk at his own funeral will probably sit up in the casket and say, I'm just fine, thank you. (laughs) A lot of Al-Anons do that, too, you know. (laughs) 
it didn't take Jim too long to find out how sick I really was. I kept burning the couches and, and uh, falling down and getting stitched up and doing really scary things. I was suicidal. I was as sick then, I think, physically and spiritually and emotionally as I ever was at any time. But he moved us, and, and we moved to Montgomery. Uh, we moved to a little kitchenette in a motel because our house was five weeks from being completed. And I moved in with Stephen, who was two and a half, and his coloring books, and John, who was just a few months old, and his formula and diapers, and my prescriptions. And I went to the first pharmacy, and I had them all filled, and I went back to the motel, and I took them in two or three days the way I'd been doing in Tuscaloosa. and went back to the pharmacist and tried to get them filled again, and he wouldn't do it. And I wept, and I gnashed my teeth, and I threatened, and all of this business, and, and I just couldn't persuade him. And, I'm, uh, and what I did was I went to the liquor store, and I bought two bottles of bourbon, and I bought one to put on the counter in the kitchenette for us, and then I bought one for me, and I hid it. And, and I hear my friends talking about sliding across that invisible line into alcoholism, and they're not sure when that happened. I know exactly when and where and how and why it happened with me. And I know now that, that I literally detoxed myself with alcohol and probably got through a really horrendous drug withdrawal with, with the help of alcohol. And I never, ever again after that was able to drink the way I had that first year of marriage. Uh, I did the humiliating, painful things that we all do from that time on. I played all the sick games. I hid it. I blacked out. I hurt Jim. We, we tried to have some sort of social life in, in a new town, and we should have with his job, and we just couldn't, I couldn't manage it. Uh, I was blacking out, and and almost passing out at every function we tried to go to. And it caused terrible problems with the marriage from that time on. We hadn't been in our house too long, and, and Jim went to work one day after a particularly bad time the night before. And for some reason, I called Alcoholics Anonymous the next morning. And I'm not sure just what my thinking was at the time. I suppose I wanted to be persuaded that I wasn't really an alcoholic, that maybe it was his fault. I don't remember too much about that meeting. I remember it was down on Bibb Street, and there must have been 500,000 stairs to climb. I remember the names of a few people that really impressed me because I knew them from Montgomery Society, and, and that impressed me that that type of people was were attending AA functions. But I can tell you almost word for word what I got when I went home because my husband was just furious with me. He was pounding the table. He said, you're not an alcoholic. I, I need to tell you, Jim's father was an alcoholic, only we didn't know it. We thought he was one of these sick, sorry, weak-willed, no good drunks. <laughs> This man had, had caused the divorce, uh, the breakup of Jim's home when Jim was just a little baby. And he was still living in Montgomery, and he was doing things to humiliate and hurt Jim and his mother and, and Jim's stepfather at the time. And we didn't know that alcoholism was a disease. But Jim was saying, you're not an alcoholic. He said, you're too young to be an alcoholic. I guess I was 24, 25 at the time. He said, you're too well-educated to be an alcoholic. School teachers are an alcoholic. He said, your father's a chaplain in the Air Force. And he said, preacher's kids are an alcoholic. That guy doesn't know to this day about preacher's kids, and I'm not about to tell him. It was, it was the first stigma I thought I had to try to live down. Some of us were talking today about smoking, and I started when I was 12, and, and one of the, you know, I was trying to get away from that label of the preacher's daughter and the goody-goody, and be careful when you talk about minister's children. But then, you know, he was really banging his fist on the table, and he said, 
Besides that, no wife of mine is going to be an alcoholic. He said, you just haven't learned how to drink like a lady, and I'm going to teach you. And we had organized, structured drinking lessons at our house. And, you know, they were fun for a while, what I remember of them. <laughs> they went something like this, and, and uh, I can tell you right now that this was in 1963 and 64, and, and I knew this was long before people were talking about women's lib, but I knew then what a male chauvinist was. I didn't know there was a name for it, but, but he was the guy, when we walked in his house, he said, here, Jim, and there was a great big jelly glass jar full of bourbon or scotch or some of the good stuff and maybe one or two ice cubes and a squirt of water or something. And then he'd say, Sally, would you care for a drink? And I'd have to say, huh, I don't know. Is Betty Lil going to have one or is Susie May or whatever? <laughs> and then I'd say, yes, I guess I will. And uh, Jim watching me very carefully and out would come the pretty fancy little glass, you know, with the long stem and, and the cherries and the orange slices and the syrup and the ice and all the goop and, and a little bit of the good stuff. And I'd have to watch him, and um, when he sipped, then I could sip. And if I sipped before he sipped and he'd glare at me and grit his teeth, then I'd have to wait until he sipped twice before I could... <laughs> And then to watch him put it down and watch the ice cubes melt, you know, and the water pile up on top of the dark stuff. And, and of course, I thought, you know, anything that you took lessons in, you ought to practice a lot. <laughs> so he'd go to work in the mornings, and, and uh, I'd practice and practice and practice and get ready for the lesson. <laughs> and he'd come home at night, and we'd have a drink and supper and then watch TV, and I'd think, oh, is he ever going to go to bed? And he'd go to bed, and I would practice and practice and practice and somehow stumble in a stupor into the bedroom and find the bed. And there was no way he could ever teach me to drink like a lady. He drinks like a lady. <laughs> I don't understand it at all. I thought, you know, last year, aha, I finally caught him. He's drinking secretly and, and somehow, and, and I'm not even seeing him when he drinks. And so I really started watching, and I found the bottle. And, you know, that bottle had been in the house 11 months. I don't understand that. I really don't. I, I remember the first time he looked at me, you know, in utter disbelief and amazement, and he said, you drink for the effect. You know, why else does anybody drink? <laughs> I, I later acquired a taste for good bourbon, uh, but nothing about hot vodka that comes out of the paper sack that comes from out from under the, the seat of the car that comes from out of the car wash when it's 95 degrees in the shade and, and you have to find that bottle and find out if anybody in the car wash took it and have a swig and it's hot. That doesn't taste good. It really doesn't. I, I don't understand all there is to understand about alcoholism, but somebody told me a couple of weeks ago, and I really liked it, that he read that the difference between the alcoholic and, and the non-alcoholic, the non-alcoholic will have a drink or two and begin to feel that little bit of loss of control and start to feel abnormal, and it frightens them, and they can't handle it, and they want to get back in control. And we alcoholics, we have that first drink or a couple of drinks or whatever to get that feeling of loss of control, and that alcohol is doing for us what we can't do for ourselves, and we begin to feel normal. And, and I can understand that, and I, I like that explanation. I think it was true with me. I think about the alcohol and, and the drugs, the medications, because I got back on, on the pills just as fast as I could find doctors and another friendly pharmacist of three or four. 
And I, I remember feeling, you know, that, that this was the only way I could handle my life and the only way I could cope. And, and it allowed me, the chemicals allowed me to cope with all the unpleasant, painful things in my life. And of course, you know, I, I found out when I finally got sober along with blocking out all the pain in my life, I also blocked out every bit of joy for 11 years. The really humiliating things that happened to me, I think most of them centered around my children and my attempts to be a good mother, and that was very important to me. I, I feel that I had had the best and I wanted to be just like her. And there's no way an alcoholic woman can be a decent mother. There was the time that I had to take all the, some 60 little Cub Scouts. I was an assistant den mother during this time. I had to take some 60 little Cub Scouts on the playground while the other mothers and the den mothers and the pack leaders and everybody was in the kitchen getting the, the hot dogs ready. And I remember falling and I remember being absolutely paralyzed. I couldn't talk and I couldn't move. And I remember seeing little six, seven-year-old Stephen Roy looking down at me with tears streaming down his face. And, and I blacked out at that point, and I came to later on that, that night at home. Jim was out of town. A friend told me the next day that she had taken me home, and her husband stayed with the, with the boys and brought them later on. I can remember a lot of those times. I was pregnant in 1966 with our third child, and I was very sick one more time, and I think at that point it was more the pill. I was drinking some, but we thought that was under control. And three months before that baby was born, Jim called my mother, and at the time she, they were living in, outside of Washington, D.C., and he said, please come. He said, I just can't handle it anymore, and I can't handle my job and the children. I'm afraid to go come home, and I'm afraid not to come home. And my mother came and stayed with us. And there was the night that they tried to wake me up. I, I had a drinking uniform when I drank. And it was a red corduroy, a dirty red corduroy bathrobe, and it had cigarette burns in it. And it had holes in the pockets, but I was in my dirty red corduroy bathrobe, and I had stuffed second all tablets down in the pocket. And they were wondering, asking me what I'd had, and I was swearing I'd had nothing at all, you know. My, my only problem was that he didn't trust me, and that's why I was nervous and acted this way. And, and I was walking down the hall, bouncing off the walls, and I was leaving a little path of second all tablets <laughs> everywhere I bounced. And my mother saw them. And I will never forget my mother on that occasion, the fury in her face. And she turned to Jim and said, if you're half the man I think you are, you will take these children and get her out of your lives because she's no good and she's no good for you. And if you need any help, that's what I'm here for. And this was a little lady that loved me better and in, in a way that, that no other person ever has or ever could. And I got off the pills at that point, and I'm so grateful that she was there because it was the first time we had ever really been together since I was 16 for any length of time. And we got to know each other a little bit those three months. She taught me how to knit, and we waited for that baby to come. And I remember, too, with that pregnancy, how, how completely out of control my thinking was. I'd been hospitalized many times during those nine months, either directly or indirectly as a result of my, my alcoholism, my addiction. And I remember wanting that baby and wanting a healthy baby so badly. This is before people talked about the fetal alcohol syndrome, but I knew that intellectually that what I was doing couldn't be good for this, this unborn person. And I remember wanting to stop so badly, and I was just, there was just no decision to be made. I just had to drink, and I had to take the pill. And the book talks about our surrendering to the addiction, and that's exactly what I did. Jody was born, and she was born healthy. Jody and our second child, John, both have 
problems, have had problems. John had behavioral problems and learning problems. And John, when he was born, even when he was a tiny baby, he was born with the symptoms of somebody withdrawing from amphetamine. And he most probably was. And that's something I have to talk about when I talk to women. Or, no doctor's ever told me that I was responsible, but no doctor's ever told me that I wasn't either. But Jody was born, and a year later, my mother died very suddenly, and I was grateful for that time with her. And I was blaming my behavior on all these things out here, and Jim, of course, was, was the biggest target, and he accepted that responsibility. I, I could provoke him at, at night, and he could say things to me that were hurt, hurtful, and he'd go to work in the morning, I'd go to the liquor store, he'd come home at night, and I'd be drunk, and he'd say, oh my God, did I do that to you? And I'd say, you certainly did. And I believed it, and he did too. Um, at one point when Jody was about a year old, I thought, you know, if I could only go to work, if I could find a stimulating, intellectually stimulating job and get away from the diapers and the, the brooms and the mops and the furniture polish and, and be with grown up people and do something challenging the way God intended for me to do. And so I went out and I got a job and it was a very good job in the prison system in Alabama. And three years later, I was thinking, oh, if I could only get away from the stress and go home and be the mother and the wife that God intended for me to be, I'd be all right. <laughs> so I quit the job, and then everything really escalated. I was taken to the psychiatrist. I used to say I went, but I didn't go voluntarily. I was taken and I was locked up. And then that's very interesting now when I think that, you know how sick I was my, my third week in Jackson's fourth floor in Montgomery and, and this was a psychiatric ward. The, the community elected me their chairman. Now that was the most gratifying thing that had ever happened to me. And I think back on that now, you know, I was head nuts <laughs> for a week. That was really big time. I loved it. And I have nothing against psychiatry, but I was too sick, to be honest. And I, when I got out of there, I, I couldn't stop drinking. I'd, I'd sober up a little bit when it was time to go see the psychiatrist on, on Friday. He gave me more tranquilizers and antabuse, and I took the tranquilizers, and I put the antabuse way, way in the back of the medicine cabinet. And he talked at me about my alcoholism, and, and he talked at me about my emotional state, and he talked about relationships that I had had and told me I was emotionally immature, and he was going to fix all these things, and then I could drink. There was a song around then, everybody's talking at me, and, and that's what was happening to me. There was also in Montgomery a very kind young Presbyterian minister. And for a while I met Tom at 3.30 every Sunday afternoon in his office. And Tom talked at me about my alcoholism and my relationship with God. And at that point I had no faith in anything except whatever was in that bottle. It was going to give me the relief that I thought I had to have. But he was treating the spiritual side of, of my illness. And the doctors were trying to treat the physical side. And somehow, late in 1969, I remembered one of those names of one of those folks at that Bibb Street meeting in 1963 that I'd gone to. And I called Sonny Patterson to come to our house, and Sonny was not anonymous in the fellowship. He was a very beautiful man. And Sonny came and sat with me in our living room, and he didn't talk at me. He very simply talked with me. And he did what we're supposed to do in, Al Al in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he shared his experience, strength, and hope with me. He told me about his disease, about his family, what had happened, and how he had recovered. And for the very first time, you know, I had that wonderful feeling that we get 
somebody actually did understand. Somebody did know. Somebody else had gone through it. And I believe it's got to be the loneliest disease there is. Jim hated him. He was in the living in the den with his ear up against the wall listening. And here this man was telling me some of the same things that he had been saying over the years. And I agreed with everything that Sonny had said, and I hadn't heard Jim yet. And he was jealous. And he'll tell you that. And I wish I could say I went to my next AA meeting and never drank again, but that's not it. You know, pain really intrigued me. And and I had to feel a lot more. I believe it's the only motivation that we drunks have. It was for me. And I just hadn't heard enough at that point. And I had to drink all the curiosity out of that bottle. I went to AA. I used AA. I abused AA. I had lovely sponsors, and they worked so hard with me. And I continued to drink and take my pills. Jim started going to Al-Anon, and I'm a big Al-Anon cheerleader. I really am. I love those people. At that time, I think there was only one other man going to Al-Anon in Montgomery. <laughs> so that's interesting. At our anniversary in Montgomery last year, I looked up at this Al-Anon meeting that they had. And there were eight people on the speaker's stand, and two of them were women, and the rest of them were all men, and they were all al -Anons. And I thought, my word, what happened? You al -Anon ladies better watch out, because they're going to take over that like they have everything else. <laughs> but at the time, I think there was one other al -Anon man going to the Capital City Group in Montgomery. Jim went to his first al -Anon meeting, and he came back. He said, I'm not going back there. He said, a bunch of women. He said, they tit and they pat and they knit and they crochet and they do all this stuff you know with needles and thread and yarn and and I'm not I and I said fine and I got drunk and he went back <laughs> Jim had to do the grocery shopping those days because I, I couldn't do it and one day he was standing in the checkout line and he picked up a copy of Women's Day and he was leaping through there, and he found a cruel embroidery kit of the Serenity Prayer. <laughs> and he made copies for his Al-Anon girls. <laughs> and he ordered it. And he sat there in our den night after night with a needle and a thick wad of woolen yarn and he'd push and poke and get that yarn through there and I was sitting there you know I thought to be a good mother I had to do things like mend so I'd mend and usually I'd sew a sock to my nightgown or something like that <laughs> but he'd sit there and he'd do this and he'd sew away at those flowers and those letters and he, he never really took, went to the, to the point of taking it to an al -Anon meeting he did all this at home and he got a third of the way through and he ran out of yarn. But he had the thickest, fluffiest, puffiest flowers and letters for a third of that prayer. And uh, then he read the instructions. <laughs> and any of you ladies or gentlemen who might cruel, you know that with wool and yarn, you have to separate it into three strands. And that's why he ran out of yarn a third of the way through. <laughs> he still got that thing, you know, and he keeps it up in the closet, and he says it reminds him that the, uh, the al -Anon, the AA programs, are something that you never finish. In one of my moments of complete insanity, I asked Jim, after a bad drunk, to... Please give me that antabuse that that psychiatrist had prescribed a couple of years before. And I'm neither for nor against antabuse. So I think it takes what it takes and whatever it takes to save us from this life and death matter is, is good. It's got to be. But I wish I had said, you know, give it to me for two weeks and then let me try to work this program. Uh, 
he took that responsibility very, very seriously. And every morning, here he'd come with that antabuse bottle and a glass of juice or a cup of coffee. And he'll tell you that that antabuse probably should have had his name on it because he gave it to me and he relaxed all over. <laughs> and he could go to work and work, you know, with some idea that when he came home, I'd be fairly sane and, and sober. Um, I did all sorts of foolish things with it. I would take the pill out of my mouth when he wasn't looking for about two weeks, and then I drank. And after that, he'd put the pill in my mouth and hand me my juice and make me open my mouth, and then he'd rub my throat. <laughs> and one day I was doing something with a chicken, and one Saturday with a chicken and some cooking cherry, and I thought, you know, I wonder if it's as bad as they say it is. And I took a little tiny bit of that cooking sherry and nothing happened. And I said, it's not as bad. And I took another little tiny sip of that cooking sherry and I'm here to tell you, it's terrible. It's God awful. And if any of you are ever take it or are taking it, don't experiment with it because it's terrible. I really honestly got thought I was dying. I went back to the bedroom and in the mirror my eyes were bulging and you could see the red veins and you could see the veins and arteries going bump, bump, bump and the heart was coming out to the front and out and the shoulder blades in the back. And Jody, I guess, was four and a half or five at the time and she came in and she said, what's the matter? And I said, I think I've got the flu. Go get Daddy. And he came in and he said, what's the matter? And I said, I don't know. I think I've got the flu. And he said, Flu, hell, you've been drinking. And I said, yes, and Jim, I'm dying. I just know I'm dying. And he called the drugstore and told them what had happened, and they assured him that I, you know, with that little bit of alcohol in the system, that I'd be all right, that there was no point in rushing me to the hospital. But I was convinced I was dying, and he was scared, and, and I was lying on the bed, and the whole room was vibrating. And Jody was all dressed up to go to a birthday party. And you know how little girls that age look forward for months to something like that. And she was ready to go. And I said, Jim, I'm dying. And he said, well, he said, okay. He said, you may have to. He said, but she's got to go to that birthday party, and you can't take her, and therefore I've got to take her. And if you don't die, when we get back, if you want to talk, we'll think about it. <laughs> and he walked out, and he left me. And I said, those damn Al-Anon women. <laughs> and it was probably one of the very best things that's ever happened to us, because at that point, he took the first step of the Al-Anon program, which is the first step of ours, and he stopped being responsible for my alcoholism or my recovery, and he started letting me hurt, and I really needed it. And that was hard for him, I know that. He used to pick me up off the floor and clean me up and put my nightgown on and tuck me up in the bed, and I'd wake up in the morning, I couldn't remember what had happened the night before, but, you know, he'd take his pillow and he'd go in and sleep on the sofa or in the boys' room with him. And I'd wake up nice and warm and clean and, and dry, And then one day I woke up and I was on the floor in that dirty red corduroy bathroom. And I hurt all over down to my hair roots. And I looked up in the bed and there he was. And he was in his pajamas. <laughs> and he was clean and dry and warm and comfortable. And he was right where he should have been. I went to a treatment center in Minnesota and I drank on the airplane coming back. I remember at that treatment center, somebody said, Sally, have you taken the first step? And I said, yes. He said, how do you feel about it? I said, it makes me mad. It makes me madder than hell that I can't drink. He said, you haven't taken the first step. And I didn't know what he was talking about. I loved being around all of you, and I liked how clean you were and how you laughed at yourself and, I, and, and everything about your sobriety. But I still wanted to drink. At least that's what my sponsor kept telling me more than I wanted to be sober. And I went back to Montgomery after that treatment program, and I started drinking such ladylike things as cooking sherry and Vicks Nyquil. When they 
poured me into my next hospital, which was my last hospitalization for alcoholism. When I got back out of that hospital, there were 22 chickens in my freezer. I, I would go to one store and I'd buy a chicken and a bottle of cooking sherry, and I'd go to the next store and I'd buy a chicken and a bottle of cooking sherry. And we found 22 chickens in my, refri- in my freezer. So December 18th that, that year, I woke up in the alcoholism ward at St. Jude's Hospital in, in Montgomery. And I went through the worst Christmas of my life, and I guess probably the best Christmas of my life. And it was in that program that I finally took the first step of the AA program. And I not only admitted that I was not powerless over alcohol, that's all it says we have to do. My life is certainly unmanageable. People who are managing their lives do not get locked up at Christmas time or locked up twice within four months. And I finally accepted it, and I knew that I accepted it because when I did, I felt such great relief. And from that time on, with one or two exceptions, I have not had a desire for alcohol. And for that, I am eternally grateful. The AA people were still there for me, and I had such problems with that second step. I thought I had used my problems with that step and my lack of faith in a and a higher power as a cop-out. A couple of years there, my sponsor was a very spiritual gal, and she tried to tell me to pray and to turn it over, and I said, I can't. There's nothing there for me to turn it over to. And I finally heard what some of those folks were saying in that, in that alcoholism ward. One of the counselors said, you know, use the group, and the AA people have been saying that to me. And I was able to do that. I used the group and I used the set. And more than anything else, I, I've used the love that I found in this program. I was certainly the most unlovable, unlikable human being that ever was. And full of self-loathing. And when my sponsor would come to me after I'd been drunk again and disappointed her and myself and everybody, and she'd say, Sally, I love you. I think, what? what she wants and why and I was so full of suspicion but that Christmas I was really so ready to listen and, and my desire to be different was so great I had learned about the disease from the AA meetings I'd gone to and I'd learned about the progression and I was in a room with a lady who was 50 years old and she looked like she was 80 and her mind was gone She kept crawling in my bed with me every morning at 5 o'clock, saying it was her bed. And her stomach was out to here with a diseased liver. And they were waiting for a bed for her at the state hospital in Tuscaloosa, the state mental hospital. And I was able to project, and I thought, you know, if I live that long, I'm going to be like that or worse. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I would be. And I had tried to kill myself several times. I decided, you know, if I did and I got there and I didn't like it, I couldn't come back. And that was the one thing that got through at one point to me. But I finally accepted the fact that some of these people might just love me and there wasn't anything in it for them except just identifying with another alcoholic. And I was able to use that love that I felt as my higher power. And later on in the discussion meeting, somebody said, you know, so simply, do you remember that that thing we learned in Sunday school that says God is love? And with that very simple, basic idea, that was the, that was the beginning of my spiritual experience, my spiritual relationship with the God of my understanding. And I wish I could say I got out of that program and never drank again, and I can't say that. I drank April 19th. She had gone to Mobile for two days, and I made it through the first day all right. And it wasn't that I had taken the first step, had not taken the first step, because I knew that whatever happened, it was really going to be bad. And I knew that I was powerless, I knew that I'd get drunk, and I was ready to accept those consequences. And it was a very, very painful experience, and it was one that was absolutely essential to my recovery and a little bit more of this pain that I had to go through. 
And I came back in the program with a different attitude and with a feeling of gratitude that I hadn't had before and a feeling of humility, I think, that I hadn't had before. And I knew that I'd better keep my mouth shut and start to listen. I was very, very sick those first six months, and, and I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I marvel at some of these people that come in the program and there's, boom, instant serenity and, and they're 12-stepping and they're on the speaker circuit. You know, I think that's wonderful. But it didn't happen that way for me. I couldn't make simple decisions. I went to AA six nights a week. I didn't go on Wednesday because that was my night to babysit for Jim to go be with his al lady. And he was still very sick. He needed that. It was a very, very painful, unhappy time. I remember watching AA people laugh and laugh at themselves. And that just made me so angry. I think it's not funny. And there's no way I'm ever going to be like that. And oh God, why can't I be like that? And why it so badly? We were camping one night. We had a little pop-up camper and we were up in Wind Creek Park. And I had to walk Jody to the, to the comfort station. And it was pitch black. And she was scared to death. And she was holding my hand with just as tight as she could. And we were walking along, and she looked up at me, and she said, Mommy, I like you. And she probably would have said that to Jack the Ripper if he'd been walking her through the woods that night. She was that scared. And it wouldn't have been nearly as effective, I don't think, if she'd even said, Mommy, I love you. Because for the first time, and, and I, you know, I was even suicidal at that point. And not that I was going to go out and kill myself, but I really didn't think that this life had too much to offer me. I was that unhappy and full of self-loathing. And, and with this little child saying, Mommy, I like you, you know, my God, what a feeling that, that gave me. And for the first time, I thought, you know, maybe I can be the kind of mother that one day my children can say that they really like. And maybe one day I could be the kind of person that I could be comfortable with and that I could like. And that was the beginning of a spiritual experience, and I had to say thank you, God. Because all the time I was trying to be this really good mother, and trying to control, and trying to manage, and trying to handle, I just made such a mess of everything. And it wasn't until I got completely out of the way that these things started happening in my life. The promises say that, that God can do and will do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And very simply, that's what has happened. But it, I had to really get out of the way. So many good things have happened. Not long after I was sober, we moved to Wicompa. And everybody in that neighborhood knew within a few months that I was an alcoholic and went to AA meetings because John and Jody Roy told them all. <laughs> Stephen came home one night he said if you don't tell those two to shut up he said I'm going to kill them he didn't want to talk about it you know and he didn't care for all of his friends knowing it <laughs> well one night we were over at a friend's house lived behind us and they had a little boy had a little boy two years younger than Jody And they said, Sally, we're working with a lawyer and he's drawing up papers for a will. And he suggests that we find a guardian to leave Chris with in case something happens to two of us simultaneously. And we've been watching you, Jim, as Chris's guardian, should something happen to us. You know, it wasn't too long before I finally got sober that my very best friend, who had a daughter who was Jody's age, told me one day, please don't ask me if you can babysit with Eva anymore. I had asked her several times, and she kept putting me off and putting me off, and finally one day she said, please don't ask me again. She said, because I promised my mother and my husband I'd never leave Eva with you alone, because we never know what shape you're in. And here that night in those, those folks' home, they said, we like what we see in your home, and would you be responsible for Chris should something happen to us. And I sat there and just bawled like a baby again. 
And walking back across my yard that night, I had to say, thank you, God, because this certainly was not of my doing. And it was just a matter of my turning it over and letting it happen. The very simple things that you told me, you know, I tried to complicate the program so much. And these very, very simple things and all the slogans and how they work. And it does work. My little sister came in the program. I'd been sober about six years and she was living in the Hawaiian Islands. I hadn't seen her for years and I didn't know she had a drinking problem. I knew that she had problems with life and living problems and it had some very traumatic, sad things happen to her. But she called me on my sixth anniversary and she said, I think you need to know I've been going to AA for four months. And she said, you've been 12 stepping me for years and didn't know it. And I had worried an awful lot about her up to that point. And I've never worried about her since. And she's had some pretty, some more pretty traumatic things happen to her. But she found the same fellowship and the same love and the same sponsorship that I found. We've seen each other twice since then for a very short time. She's now living in, in outside of Anchorage, Alaska. And, and one of the nicest things that's happened to me, I guess, is being able to serve as delegates from Alabama, Northwest Florida area. In April, I attended the General Service Conference in New York City, and at the reception that Sunday afternoon, I was introduced to this very tall, attractive gal, and she was a new delegate from Alaska. She said she lived close to Anchorage, and I said, uh, do you ever go to the meetings in Wasilla? And she said, that's my home group. I said, do you know a dippy little blonde named Elise? And she said, I'm her sponsor. And I said, I'm her sister. And you know, one more time, over thousands of miles, I was able to touch her life in, in such a very special way through this, through this fellowship. It hasn't all been good. There have been some rough times, and I think, you know, again, that, that I'm, I'm grateful for the pain in my life. I hope I've grown from it. I know I've learned from it. I take the program for granted sometimes and I can become very complacent very easily. And a couple of years ago, in June of 82, I had a serious heart attack. And I knew what it was and I knew it was pretty, probably pretty bad. And I was on my way in the ambulance that Sunday to the hospital and I remember marveling at the lack of fear that I felt and, and the serenity and the acceptance and the gratitude that I felt for my life. And I remember saying, you know, if this is my time, I know that without a doubt that I've lived more in 10 years in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous than most people probably ever live in a lifetime. And I was really ready for whatever. And I felt this way through a week in intensive care. And then they put me in my own room, and I woke up one morning, and I was madder than hell. You know, and one more time, I was shaking my fist at God, and I was saying, why me, God, and it's not fair, and I was so filled with fear and anxiety, and I went into a terrible depression that, that lasted several months. And when I got home one night, I was lying in my bed, and at four in the morning, I was just so angry and and uptight and clenching my fists and I thought somehow the thought came to me you know you really don't have to live like this if you don't choose it you've got a program and you've got 12 steps and they offer you so much more than just a, a way of not drinking AA offers me a quality of life and it's there free for the for the doing and the willingness and I had to start over with step one of the AA program, and my life was unmanageable. I was completely powerless over me, and the only thing I was doing right was not drinking. And I had to move on to the second step and spend a lot more time with the third step. And I took an inventory and a fifth step. And I try to remember that. The family is good, and I, I've got to tell you about this. It is a family disease. When I stopped drinking, Stephen was 11, going on 33. That was the oldest little boy you've ever seen in your life. 
And so many alcoholics' first children are, and some of them become our parents. But he has felt so much responsibility, he'd have to call his father and say, Daddy, I can't wake Mommy up, and she's on the floor, and she's cut her head. What do I do? Or Jim would call and play the game with Steve and on the phone, you know, how is your mommy? You know, just say yes if she's listening or no, and, you know, this type thing. I thought I was being such a good mother at one time by being a den mother, and he told me later on a couple of years ago, he said, you'll never know how much I hated Cub Scout. He said, because I knew every Tuesday to get to that meeting, you'd have something. But he was an old little boy. And John was nine, and, and the month after my last drink, we took John to a psychologist at the request of the school officials because his behavior was so out of control. And this psychologist, the psychologist tested him and called Jim and me in for a consultation, and the first thing she said was, Mrs. Roy, have you been sick lately? And I had to say all of his life, even since he was conceived. And I told her about my alcoholism and my drugs. And Jody, bless her heart, was almost sick. And she says she doesn't remember too much about my drinking, and I, I really don't think she does. But Jody grew up in open AA meetings with me. She, she loved to go. She just absolutely loved it. From the time she was six on it, she'd get really huffy and puffy if I went to a closed meeting or it was a school night and she couldn't go. And she took a coloring book and she'd fall asleep at the table, but, you know, she could sure tell you if you hadn't said the preamble or if you had gone too fast, that you know, with a moment of silent meditation or whatever. I don't think Jody really knows what an alcoholic is, a practicing alcoholic. I think for a long time she thought that we were a bunch of folks that went to meetings every night and drank gallons of coffee and smoked fast and laughed a lot. And that's fine. Stephen is 23. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Alabama in accounting last December, and he and his little bride live in Birmingham. They were married last summer. Tracy came to me, and she said, Mrs. Roy, do you have some AA thing that you have to go to in July in Montgomery? And I said, yes, it's an area assembly on the second weekend in July. And they were married the first weekend. And when Stephen travels and goes out of town, Tracy comes and stays with us, and, and we have a good relationship, and we can talk a lot. And she likes to be with us, and that's neat. Stephen stopped kissing me goodnight when he was about eight, and I can remember the looks of fear on his face, and I didn't push him. And he's told me so many times, you know, it was the fear of the unexpected. He never knew what shape I was going to be in. But he's learning to hug and to touch and to kiss now. And sometimes he's still awfully awkward at it, but that's okay. Before I went back to the hospital for a heart catheterization, I couldn't sleep one night, and John said, and he came down. He was 18 at the time, and we started talking. I guess we talked at that 4.30 in the morning, and we talked a lot about my alcoholism. And finally, for the first time, I said, John, can you forgive me for those first nine years of your life? And he's the maverick in our family. He's the one who's going to have to feel a lot of pain, I think. But I said, can you forgive me for those first nine years? And he thought a minute and he looked at me and he said, yeah, Mom. He said, can you forgive me for the last nine? <laughs> and we cried a little and hugged and, and that's good. And John's in good shape now. And I'm very grateful that my family's still together, and I have to give the credit to that for Jim and his stubbornness and the graces of the God of my understanding. I certainly can't take any credit for it. A couple of years ago on my AA birthday, we came with an AA and an Al-Anon friend up here to uh, Stone Mountain. And that April the 20th was the Sunday, and it was a gorgeous day. And we sat on top of that big rock. There must have been 60 or 70 little Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. And they were seated in their Cub Master, Pack Leader, whatever, had the Bible. And 
he was leading them in a morning uh, meditation. And the rest of us who were up there just sort of sat on the fringes of this group and listened in. And he read from the book of Genesis, and he talked about the creation, and he talked about God. And he talked about the God that loved even the greatest and the, and the magnitude of his creation. And he talked about the greatness, and we were able to see the forest and the rivers and the city and the clouds and the mountains. And it was easy to believe in. And then he talked about the God that loved even the tiniest, most insignificant creatures. And he told about the freshwater shrimp that live up there in that granite mountain. And there are potholes up there, I guess, that have been carved out from hundreds of thousands of years of weather and glaciers and whatnot. And they hold water when it rains, and then the sun warms this water. And when it gets to a certain temperature, these little eggs hatch and these little tiny microscopic freshwater shrimp emerge and they swim like crazy and they breed and there are more eggs formed and deposited and then the sun comes and dries the water and the shrimp die but the eggs are there waiting for the next cycle to continue and he talks about how God loved even the smallest of his creatures and that morning I was so filled with absolute, utter gratitude and a feeling of amazement that, that I had my life and it was the quality of life that it was. And gratitude, I guess, for the greatest gift, which is, is the love that I can feel now and the love that I can receive openly and honestly. And again, I found myself, you know, with this why me God only this time it was why this miracle for me. And if you think about it, think about the miracle that we all are. For each one of us who gets sober and stays sober, some 36 others have to die alcoholic death. And isn't that a miracle? I heard an AA tape by a very beautiful lady, Sister Pat, who here at St. Simon's Island a couple of years ago. And she quoted something in there from the song that Bette Midler sang in the rose, and, and it means so much to me. And I think that it epitomizes the hope of recovery that we all have in this program. And if you would, I'd like to share a verse of it with you now or the chorus. It's the heart afraid of breaking that never learns to dance. And it's the dream afraid of waking that never takes a chance. It's the one who won't be taken that never learns to give, and it's the soul afraid of dying that never learns to live. So when your night has been too lonely and the road has been too long, and you think that love and sobriety are for the lucky and the strong, just remember, in the winter, far beneath the bitter snow, lie the seeds that with the sun grow in the spring become the road. I thank you very much, and I love you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.